You're listening to the original EER, the home of Elvis music on the web. Elvis Express Radio. Okay, yes, the fourth special hour, the third and final week of our interview with Mindy Miller, Joe's interview with Mindy Miller. Um, anything you want to say about this week's uh, interview, Joe? Uh, I, you know, I enjoy doing it. She's such a sweetheart, and as you can tell, she loves talking about Elvis. Uh, yeah. This one's the harder one. I, like I said, I don't like making people cry, but you can tell when she's crying. That she has still, to this day, a love for Elvis. Absolutely. Well, that's, that comes over already, so this one is going to be or well, it's going to be um, amazing, I think. Yeah, I think everybody amazing. will enjoy it. So, Well, thank you, Joe. Thank you uh, for doing this. And uh, again, thank you to Mindy Miller. Uh, I'm sure we're going to love this just as much as we have the last two weeks. And um, thank you again and again and again. Joe, interview. In- introduce <laughs> your interview <laughs> with the wonderful Mindy Miller for the last time. The third installment of the Mindy Miller interview. Let it go. Okay, I'm back with Mindy. Uh, Mindy, we were talking about the last time uh, you uh, you heard or talked to Elvis and that. I'm sorry uh-huh. I cut you off. Go ahead. If there's anything else. Yeah, and so the next time that I physically saw him after that in 77 was at his funeral. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that now or save that to the no, very end. I'll we'll do it now. You. We'll do it now. How did you find out that Elvis passed? Um, I got a phone call, <clears throat> and um, my friend at the time called me, and um, I'd been out driving, and I was driving the car he gave me, actually, and uh, I got into my apartment in West Hollywood, and the phone was ringing, and I picked it up, and I heard this person's voice. And I knew this person very, very well, and I knew the voice very well. And all they had to say was my name. And they said, Mindy. And I just knew. That's all they said. From the tone, from the intonation of the tone of the way they said my name, I just knew. And I said back into the phone, I said, he's gone, isn't he? It's exactly what I said. I said, he's gone. And the voice on the other end of the phone said, yes, he is. And I just remember falling down to the ground with the phone in my hand. And I couldn't even cry. I was in such, such shock. I couldn't even cry. I was beyond devastated, and I could not believe it. And yet, I wasn't surprised. Right. If that makes any sense. If that makes any sense. Because I knew he wasn't well. Um, You know, I had hoped for the best that he would have a turnaround from his illnesses. He was very, very ill. I did not know how ill at the time. um, Because he put on a really brave front and a really brave, um, you know, I mean, he still went out and sang and did the shows um, when he shouldn't have been. So... There was that part of me, Joe, that couldn't believe it and yet was not surprised. Right. And it was in the afternoon, and uh, I was told that Joe would be calling me very shortly uh, to give me all the information to come back to Memphis for the funeral and that I should gather my wits about me as best I could and get packing. So that's what I started to do. And um, then I got a call from Joe. And uh, Joe wasn't even crying. I couldn't even believe it. But he had to keep it together. Because he was the one with Vernon, Elvis's daddy, that um, decided about the funeral and who was going to be invited and who wasn't, who was coming, who wasn't. what the funeral was going to be like, they had to put this all together immediately. They kept on taking care of business. They kept on taking care of business. Yes. One of the last things I said to Joe was, you know, how are you doing, Joe? Um, Not long before he passed away recently. And um, he said, "Uh, I'm still taking care of Elvis. 
I'm still taking care of business. Um, and those were some of the last words I ever heard Joe say. And, uh, he was still thinking about his friend. And um, he called me and uh, he had to hold it together. And he said, uh, we're sending out the Lisa Marie for you and some people from L.A., and you'll be getting on the plane. Uh, and he said, it'll probably be your last time on the plane, Mindy. And I said, I know. And um, so then he told me where to go to catch the plane out to LAX. And I called my mom and my family, who Elvis had also spoken to. And um, I said, Mom, I said, you know, Elvis has passed. And I said, I'm going to the funeral. And she burst into tears and all that. And uh, I called a few people because I had to let them know I wasn't going to be there, that I was leaving immediately. And by this time, everybody knew. The whole world knew. And my phone was ringing off the hook. I didn't even answer it because I got so many calls that uh, I, I knew what it was and I couldn't answer. So literally, I was starting for the door, and I, the phone rang again, and I thought, well, and I don't know why. I don't know why. <clears throat> well, I do know why now. But... <laughs> <laughs> at the time, at the time, I didn't know, but something told me, answer this call, answer this one, and I did. And, you know, God makes no mistakes. And it was God telling me, get this one. So I picked up the phone, and it was Joe again, and he said, uh, he said, cancel that. He said, uh, I said, what, cancel coming to the funeral? He said, no, cancel going on the Lisa Marie. He said, nobody is allowed on the plane. I said, you're kidding he said, no. I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, Priscilla won't allow anybody on the plane. He said, so you and Linda and other people will not be going on the Lisa Marie. I said, well, Joe, how are we supposed to get there? And he said, well, we've had to make special arrangements on American Airlines. He said, um, and they're bumping people off the planes. People are, are giving up their seats, <laughs> which makes me cry. Oh, people gave up their seats so that we could get on the plane to go to the funeral and um, I won't say what I think about that but uh, that's how we got there and um, uh, you know then after the funeral we did come back on the Lisa Marie and uh, we were quote unquote allowed to fly on the plane back to California and we came back with uh, I think Anne Margaret flew out from Vegas, so she flew back to Vegas, and George Hamilton was on the plane, and some other people were on the plane uh, that were at the funeral that came back. But uh, that was that was the little story of the plane flight. Needless right. to say, that was just the plane flight. <laughs> How was it when you got to Memphis? Um, I barely remember even landing. I was in such a daze, Joe. I remember that. One of the guys came and got me at the airport. They picked me up and took me to a hotel to stay at the hotel because the house was being readied um, for the funeral. So nobody was really allowed to stay at the house except the immediate family, you know. Right. And um, so I stayed in the hotel, and then I was told the next morning I'd be picked up. And what the uh, what the arrangements were for the for the next two or three days. <clears throat> and um, I don't even remember who picked me up and drove me. I want to say it might have been Al, but I honestly don't remember. I was in such a daze and I was so tired. And I remember that we could barely get to Grayson. The streets were so packed. The cars were lining the streets. Um, I think we had a police escort. <clears throat> Because we, we couldn't maneuver. We couldn't drive through the streets. And people were lining the streets. People were fainted. People were laying on the streets. They were crying. It was something that I have never, ever seen. Um, I was in complete shock just to see that. Not even imagining what I was going to see when I got to the house. And um, we got to the gate. And uh, we pulled up to the gates, and, you know, they knew who was driving, of course. And he said, I've got Mindy here. 
and we're coming into the house. So, of course, you know, they opened up the gates and let us in, and people were staring into the car. Well, who's that, and who's in the car, and who got to go? And, you know, we always like that. Well, who's going in? Who's going in? Who's that? Right. And we got into the front, and we did pull up to the front of the house, um, and cars were lined up in the front of the driveway all the way back down to the gate. Got up to the front, went out, walked into the house, and I wore black the whole time I was there. And, you know, not thinking, I should have worn white because sure. Elvis's, favorite, Elvis's favorite color was white. Well, but I was, so, I was so devastated that I didn't think of wearing white to his funeral. And being in the hot summer heat in August, I should have. But, you know, I'm thinking in terms of black, it's a funeral. Sure. Had I been thinking straight, I would have worn white because that was his favorite color. And, you know, all the white limos and the white casket and his white suit that his daddy buried him in, everything was white. And I should have known better, but I wasn't thinking in that moment. Um, so I got in there and everybody was in black. And uh, the first person I looked for was my girlfriend and uh, Joe. And um, and I uh, found them, and I just slumped into their arms and finally burst into tears for the first time. I hadn't cried until I actually got into the house. And I hadn't been in the house in, I don't know, six or seven months or whatever it was. And I just let go. I just absolutely lost it. And uh, started asking questions about where certain people were and who was presiding over the, you know, who was going to do the eulogy and who's going to do this and who's going to do that. And uh, I was, you know, walked around and said hi to a few people. But I, I was really like a zombie. I walked around. Um, by that time, the upstairs had been off limits. No one was allowed to go upstairs. <coughs> And uh, I wanted to go back into the bedroom, the east bedroom, but nobody was allowed up. Right. And um, so we walked everywhere else in the house, um, walked into the backyard, got a breath of fresh air, walked outside to get some air, walked back in. Basically just a zombie. I walked around, said hi to people. Um, I wasn't really able to eat, but one of the maids came out and said, Mindy, you have to eat something, honey. She says, you have to eat. you got to keep your strength up. She says, you've got another day or two to go, you know, at which point I burst into tears again. And I said, I, I can't eat. I can't drink. I can't do anything. She said, honey, you have to. She brought me out a plate of food and she made sure I ate. And um, people, you know, different people will come up to different people and everybody said, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And then I finally said, how did it happen? What happened? And um, a couple of other guys sat me down that were in the know and that really knew and said, here's what really happened. And uh, they told me, and I was devastated, just devastated. And um, Did you have I, to... I, Go ahead. I, 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 caught, I just couldn't believe that he'd been left alone that many hours. Right. Um, I was shocked. I was shocked. And... Um, you know, I said some things I won't repeat, and um, I was angry. I, I, I went from being dumbfounded to just angry. And uh, most people that were there, were, they had gotten to the point of being angry. It, you know, it changed from being in shock to sadness to anger. We were going through all these different emotions, all of us that were there, Um because we just couldn't believe it. We, we, we just could not believe he was gone. And uh, we were angry that some people weren't on watch, that the people that were hadn't come upstairs, or maybe he didn't want them upstairs because he had his private time. So we just were trying to figure out what had happened, you know, and we were trying to come up with answers. And those of us that weren't there um, were trying to fathom what had really gone on, you know? Right. So um, that night, uh, his body was not there. And uh, but I remember anyway. I, again, I was so torn. And I, 
I think it was the next day, I went back to the hotel. I don't even remember going to the hotel, Joe. I don't remember sleeping. I don't remember getting up or getting dressed. I, I mean, I literally am blacked out. I don't remember a thing. I was so in shell shock. And then somebody came and got me again, took me back to the house, and his body was on view in the music room. And uh, I remember going in the front door again into the foyer and seeing everybody again and hugging everybody and, you know, just kind of milling around. People were milling. They were just walking aimlessly in the house. I mean, they were sitting and talking and telling stories and, and what they remembered and how they met him and as you, I guess, normally do. But I think we were still in shock that I just saw people roaming around, really. Was there a lot of people there in the house? There were a lot of there were a lot of people there, but but it was a lot of of his close family and friends. It wasn't uh, strangers or people or fans. It wasn't any of that. It was people that really knew him, um, that were privately invited to be a part of the wake. Um, people that were said they were at the funeral were at the funeral, which was Forest Hills. That was not the wake. Okay. That was not in his home. That was different. Part of the funeral party, part of the funeral over that two or three day period was in Graceland. But if they said they went to the funeral itself, that was basically um, the mausoleum. And that was basically where thousands of people gathered. You didn't even have to be invited. You just went. There were many people that went that told stories. There were entertainers that went. They just went. They took it upon themselves to go, find out what time, and just went. Um, they were not invited. Um, so those were not people that were in the house. You had to be invited by the Elvis Circle to be in the house. So basically it was people we knew, some who I had not met uh, when I was around. Uh, some people that had not been a part of the circle when I was there. Um, but uh, we all had our own individual viewing time with him. And um, they said, Mindy, you can have your own time. Take as long as you need. And I went back and forth several times just to visit with him. And I went back and I took a chair and sat down beside his place where he rested. And um, I talked to him. I told him, thank him for all that he did for me and all that he did for the world and all that he gave. And uh, I told him how I missed him and I loved him and... Uh, how we just couldn't believe he was gone, but I said, I'm so happy now you're with your mama. I said, you're with Gladys. I said, and that's, that's the best part of it all. I knew that <clears throat> he was with her, and uh, that was the best part. And uh, I went back and forth and back and forth, and then I went with a friend here and there, and uh Many times I lost it, and then I'd gather myself together and walk out. And uh, maybe get a little something to eat or drink and walk back and just kept going back, you know. Right. I kind of I kind of half expected him and his humor and his crazy sense of humor to sit up and go, ah, oh, I had y'all food, you know. <laughs> I was really praying at some point that... Um, that he would, you know, just sit up and go, it's all a game, it's all a bad joke, you know. I really did. I really, really did. And then there were other times, knowing his humor, knowing his humor, that he would, you know, be thinking, well, damn, he wore that to my funeral? How dare you? You know, <laughs> he would he would say, say funny things like, well, you're not looking too good, buddy, you know. He, he, his sense of humor was so crazy and so sick sometimes in a positive way that he would... He would say things, even even when 80,000 people were passing through for the viewing. There were many times where, where you kind of chuckle under your breath and say, oh boy, if he could see what this guy's wearing, he would just laugh his ass off, you know, really, seriously, because that's who he was. When, when we went to the funeral of one of his friends in Colorado, I remember we were sitting in the pew in the, in the, back in, to the side of, of the church, again, so that 
he wouldn't cause um, commotion or panic or anything, knowing that Elvis Presley is sitting here at the funeral because nobody knew he was there except the insiders of, you know, the police force. So they sat us back to the side in the pew, and we had dark sunglasses on, and we were bowing our head. And there were so many times during the time we were laughing hysterically, and people thought we were crying. And we were laughing because Elvis had said something so funny that we just burst out, and we had to make it sound like we were crying instead of laughing. <laughs> and people don't know that side of him. You know, the general public doesn't really know that side of him, that he would do the wildest, craziest things at the wildest, craziest times. You know, and unless you really knew him, you didn't know that part of him. And so who would think that we're, you know, sitting back in the pews and they think we're crying and we're laughing? Because Elvis <coughs> would say something funny, you know, um, or under his breath, and all, everybody around him, the two or three people that were sitting next to him would hear him. And he'd say something like, you know, that poor, sorry, son of a bitch would, you know, da-da-da-da-da. And we would just howl. We'd be howling. <laughs> and there was a part of me, Joe, that couldn't but help uh, during the viewing and during uh, people passing by that he would not be saying something like that. Because that was who he was, you know? Were you silly some a gun, you know, or whatever? He he was. That's who he was. Did That's you, who he was. Did you get a chance to talk to Vernon? Um, I went up to Vernon and um I had given my condolences and he was he was a man shattered. He was just beyond shattered. Uh they had to help him walk. Al had to help me walk. I could barely walk when we went to the uh, mausoleum. I could I could barely put what, put one foot in front of the other, and Vernon was the same way. He was just beyond devastated. He, you know, my son, my boy, my boy, my son. Um, he could barely talk, so I did not want to sure. prolong anything. You sure. know, I yeah. went up to him. And I said, you know, Mr. Presley, I'm, I'm so, so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't know what to say, Joe. What do you say? Yeah. Everything has been said by everybody else. And there's only so much the poor man could go through. And so many times he could say thank you, thank you, or I can't believe it. Or, you know, you just, we were really, all of us, I think, were at a loss for words. We just didn't. We could not find the words. We just didn't know what to say other than, well, what the hell happened? And that's when we were angry. I remember the most talking I did was in anger, you know, yeah. um, trying to find out what was, what was going on. Other than that, I was in shock. Um, I, you know, said hi to everybody I could, said I'm sorry to everybody that I could, um, and I know that uh, the last viewing that I was able to have with him privately, I had had a little prayer book, a very, very thin little prayer book. And um, I had underlined some, some passages in it that he would have liked. And I knew that he would have liked to have been, you know, buried with, something of the saying of the Lord with him. And so I underlined some things I thought he might like. And I put it under the left side of his lapel in the white suit that his daddy had him buried in. And I um, put my hand to his hand and I um, I kissed him on the forehead um, uh, two or three times. And uh, I said, you know, this is it. I won't be seeing you again. <laughs> um, and I put the prayer book there. I hope to God nobody took it. I hope to God it's still with his body. And I never spoke about it to anybody. I never talked about it to anyone and uh, never wrote about it. But I hoped that he was able to take that little prayer book with him 
to the other side, and um, you know, I I'm, I'm sure he did. I I you know I kissed him on the forehead. I did not want to kiss him anywhere else. I didn't think that was appropriate behavior, and um, said our goodbyes, and uh, then that was that night, and then the next day went. Uh, gotten one of, I don't even remember which number I was in, uh, the white, uh, they had to send all over the country, as I heard, all everywhere to bring in, I think it was 14 or 18 white um, limousines. Uh, the limousines, yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I'm putting myself back there and I lose my thought even now because I'm putting myself there, so I'm, I'm there as we speak. And um, got in the limousine and uh, I just remember like Elvis staring out the window and I remember for the first time for the very first time I really got what it must have been like to be him because I stared out the entire way and never took my nose from the window pane Joe in absolute awe of all these people coming out to see him. And I remember they were now looking back at me and looking back at everybody in every single car. And I remember thinking, this is what it must have been like for him his entire life. Hmm. And I finally got it. And I remember saying to him out loud in the car, I said, so Elvis, this is what it was really like for you. And I started talking to him and I said, this is what it was like. I said, I'm so sorry. I said, how could we have known? We couldn't have known. We could only have imagined we were there with you, but we weren't you. Was there other people so in the I car remember- with you? Was there other people in the car with you on? Um, I don't remember. Oh, okay. I don't remember. That's how bad it was. I don't remember. I was in my own little world. I don't even remember. I know somebody was driving the car, (laughs) but I was so beside myself. I was in a state of hysterics, but quietly. And I was crying. I mean, there were tears just streaming down my cheek, both cheeks, when I was staring out the car. But I remember talking to him, and and I didn't care if if somebody heard me or not at that point, you know. And um, I'm sure they didn't care if I was talking either. But I remember when he would stare out the windows and just be staring and thinking. And... That's when I finally knew why he was thinking the way he was and what he was thinking. He could never, ever believe that he was living that life. He did, but he would always say, it's like a dream, and I'm going to wake up from it, and it's all going to be gone. And in that moment, in the car, I said the same thing. I said, this isn't even real. I'm in a dream right now. And I've never really woken up from it. Never. And I remember that when the procession finally got to Forest Hills, I could, I got out of the car and my legs were wobbling. And I, I want to say, I think Al was with me. I think Al Strada was in the car because I do remember him holding me up. So I think it must have been Al in the car with me. And we were we were close. We were close. And Al helped me start to walk. I couldn't even walk. I started to fall several times. And I thought, how am I going to do this? I can't even get to the mausoleum because I couldn't believe we were going to actually bury him. And <clears throat> I didn't even realize I was walking behind Ann Margaret and Roger Smith somebody sent me a picture just recently actually and my head was down and I was crying my eyes out and I couldn't even tell it was me but a fan a fan said oh this is you Mindy and I looked I blew the picture up and sure enough it was me 
behind Anne Margaret, and then Al was to my left holding me. And then there's another picture of us walking through the mausoleum that I I didn't even know that was me till years later. I thought it was somebody else. I didn't even recognize myself. And it was Al holding me up, walking through the mausoleum, holding one of my arms, and my, my hand is just limp. My left hand is just limp. And he sat with me through the... Um, through the entire, um, you know, thing. And uh, I just cried my eyes out. And I said, I was crying and I said, they can't put him in the dark. They can't put him in the dark. He was afraid of the dark. They can't put him in the dark. And I said, he's got to have some light. He's got to have lights on. He's afraid of the dark, you know. So (laughs) that was... um, Part of the last part of it, and uh, I saw a lot of people around the casket. I could not bring myself to even go to the casket. I couldn't even do it. I just, I couldn't. Was I it, had said my Was it still open? House. Was it still open at Forest Hill? No, it was. No, it was closed. And he had beautiful, beautiful red roses all over the casket. Beautiful long stem red roses, just all over. And a lot of people took a, one red rose and they kept it you know, as a remembrance of that day. But I had said my goodbye at the house. I had said my goodbye in person. I didn't want to say goodbye in a closed casket. Right. I just didn't. I just didn't. I had my time with him. I said, let everybody else say goodbye because this is, they never got to see him. Most of the people that were there never got to see him. They only got to see a closed casket. So I said, let him go. And, you know, then after that, we went back to the house. And I was just shaking the whole time. I don't, you know, Joe, I don't even remember the drive back. Hmm. I mean, I'm thinking back now. I don't even remember the drive back. I, I don't. And I know that people were lining the streets. I I, I think, I, I, I don't know. Maybe I passed out. I don't even remember. I don't even remember. And uh, somehow we got back to the house and... Uh, we had the wake, and we had another service, and we sat in the folding chairs and read from the Bible, and we sang, and uh, I think Jackie Kahane spoke, and different people spoke. I can't even remember who all spoke. Uh, Vernon couldn't speak. He was just, he was beyond. He couldn't even talk, and... Uh, we just sat around looking at each other. Just an empty house. Empty in the sense that he was not there anymore. Right. Knowing that he would never come back. And from that moment on, it was never the same house for me. And I've never been back. You'll and, never go uh, back. I've never, You'll never go back? I don't back? know that I'll... Uh, I can't say I'll never go back. Um, I've, I haven't been back since. I've had no desire to go back because it's not the same house. It's all been redecorated. It was not the house that he lived in during the time he was alive at the end. And I kind of wish the house would have been kept that way so his fan could have seen the way he lived toward the end of his life. You know, I think that would, would have been important for them to see. They can see pictures of it, but to be able to walk through the house as it was when he left, I think would have been very important for his fans to see that. Sure. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what they would have thought of his taste or anybody's taste. It's the way he lived. But it's all been changed, unfortunately. Right. And it doesn't even look like a home that's been lived in. You know? Um, So I've had a desire to go back. Uh, I have not been to the meditation garden since they moved him. Um, I don't know if I'll go back next year. I mean, I've been invited to go back, you know, if that happens, and I'll go. Um, you must feel better, to... though. Don't you feel better, though, that he was brought back to Graceland? I do, and I and I feel a lot better because here's the irony of the whole thing, Joe. The irony is that one of my favorite places and one of his favorite places was the um, Buddhist meditation gardens in Pacific Palisades, which I have visited many times before I knew him during the time I knew him and after he passed, which was another thing we had in common. 
And um, when he decided to do the meditation garden, he patterned them after the meditation garden in Pacific Palisades. And ironic that he loved that area so much and what it represented in passing over. And I will tell you that I don't think he ever imagined that he would be buried there in his own meditation gardens that he built. Yeah. Now, isn't that something? No. But yet, it stands to reason. Because he used to go very often privately, um, as have I, to the woman who founded this um, sanctuary in Pacific Palisades. And it's escaping my, my, my mind right now. But he used to have many private audiences with her, just one-on-one. And he would drive there himself. He wouldn't even go with the bodyguards. He would get in the car and drive by himself, one of the few things he did by himself, to her place and uh, have private sessions with her. Uh, meditative sessions, Bible sessions, meditations about the Yogananda yogis, uh, the prayer system, the belief system. Even though he was a Christian, he was very open to all other religions. And he felt that God wanted him to be open to other religions because we all, even as human beings, we all believed in our own God of our own understanding. So whether you believe in Moses or whether you believe in Jesus Christ or the Buddha or Zen or whatever it is, Elvis was well aware and understood that you had to go on your own path. But it was all in a final resting place of heaven. You understand? Right. So he understood this. So he never put anybody's belief system down, saying, well, if you're not the true Christian or you're not the true born-again Christian, you're going to go to hell. He never saw things that way. And so he was always open to other religions and other teachings, and this is why he was such a voracious reader of other religious teachings. And he looked into everything. And he always said, you know, even at the end when he was wearing the Jewish, uh, the... um, Right. Hi, he says. I don't want to be left out of heaven on a technicality, <laughs> you know. And and you know there had been those that had said that he was part Jewish, that his mother Gladys was Jewish, but never talked about it because it wasn't apparently from the days of Hitler a good thing to talk about. So, um, you know that that's open to question ability as well. But um, so, you know. To have the meditation gardens at Graceland and to believe so much of them and love them as much as he did, it makes perfect sense that he should be laid to rest there. Okay. And I'm really happy for him. Um, and I will say this, uh, if he is really there, uh, that he is laid there. Because there's also been questioned that he could be elsewhere, but this is the place of worship when you want to, you know, give your alms and you want to give your respects and honor to Elvis. Now, there have been those that have said that he may not be there, but he actually may be somewhere else, very private, which nobody knows. Because you don't believe so, that. Do you believe that, Mindy? I don't know. I don't know. I, I believe that he is there. But, you know, there are so many questions that have come up as to where the family really is. And, you know, like Jesse, his little baby brother, is not there uh, because they could not find the real grave of Jesse. It never had a marker. Right. So they couldn't, they couldn't find it to bring him there, but yet he has a plaque there, right? Right. So there you are. So who was to say? Who was to say unless we were there and the casket was opened, and we saw his body there, that he is there. I wasn't there. So, of course, I believe, for me, that he's there. But there has been that question put there, which I never thought of. I never thought about it. Somebody put the question out there, and they said, well, what if he's really not there, but somebody, someplace else more private? I said, well, isn't that interesting? <laughs> uh, Mindy, is there a question that you've always wished somebody had asked you? about Elvis, but they never have? I don't know if it's a question that I wish that they asked, but 
um, there were a couple of questions that have never been asked, which I thought were kind of cute. They were funny. And one was, did he snore? Did he snore? <laughs> did he snore? Okay. And what, and what were his feet like? Okay. Did he have nice feet? And uh, they weren't questions I wish somebody would have asked, <laughs> because I was trying to think, I was trying to think, what question would I wish someone would ask? Okay. Uh, well, did he had, did, did he snore? No, he didn't snore. Okay, did he I have nice feet? I don't remember. <laughs> I think I think I think he slept so soundly, but I don't ever remember him snoring. And I think a couple of times that he did, I think I think one time he actually said to me, uh, "Honey, if I snore, just tap me on the side and I'll roll over." But you know. I don't ever remember him snoring. Okay. And so much of the time when he was sleeping, I would just watch him sleep. I wanted to be awake in case he woke up. So there were many times I didn't sleep at all. I just laid awake and I would watch him and I would watch him sleep. And he was so beautiful just to watch him sleep. You protected he was him. The most, yeah, he was the most beautiful looking man. He had the most gorgeous skin. And I've had many people ask me, uh, they write me or they ask me on Facebook or they call me or something and say, Mindy, you know, they never got to see him in person or they never got to see him up close or anything. They only saw pictures of him. And these close-up pictures, he was such, such a beautiful man. I mean, he really was. If you look at his grandparents, his grandparents on his mother's side, on Gladys's side, her parents were absolutely stunningly beautiful. Her grandfather, her father, Gladys's father, was just the most handsome man. And I think he really got the best of the best in his family genetics. Um, <laughs> but, but he was so good looking. And I always tell them, I said, he was, if you can imagine, more handsome in person than any picture ever taken of him. That's how beautiful he was. He was like a Greek god statue that somebody just chiseled that came alive. You just couldn't believe it. And you couldn't believe that out of the mouth of babes came this voice. This voice sang the most beautiful lyrics and songs. And, and you know, I was listening to his gospel. I've been listening to his gospel albums all week uh, because of Christmas. And, you know, I'm singing along with them. And I, you know, sometimes I forget what a beautiful voice he had. Because sometimes you just, you keep hearing him sing these silly songs from the movies, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, rock, oh, the baby, rock. <laughs> and yet he'd sing that, and then he'd sing How Great Thou Art. And then he'd sing, you know, get down, sweet chariot come and let me ride. Get down, chariot, you know. And you'd hear his voice, and you'd just, God almighty. You'd forget that, that he had such a range of talent. You know, and so I would, I would literally, I'd be laying there, and I'd kind of sit up and watch him for hours, just sleep. I wanted to make sure everything was okay, that he was in slumber, he wasn't waking up, he wasn't going to the bathroom, you know, and I would just watch him. And I'd be so thrilled just to watch over him, just to watch over him. And I don't remember him snoring. Isn't that funny? Yeah. And and he did have beautiful feet, everybody. If you're if you're listening, not only did he have the most beautiful, long, expressive fingers, as we all have seen, his fingers were that of an artist. But he had beautiful toes and he had beautiful feet. And he <laughs> his feet his feet were interesting because he did a lot of karate with them. And so he had to get in his feet in certain positions. And I did a lot of Kempo. He had me taking Kempo from Ed Parker, but I had been doing Shotokan karate before I met him. So of course, we had that in common, too. And when you you work a lot with your feet like that, you can get bunions or sores. He had the most beautiful feet because a lot of times he went barefoot, but he wore socks. But he had a, a range that he could move his ankles and his toes in such a way, much more so than the average person because of all the karate he did and all the kicking and the things that you do and, and all the musculature that has to go with your ankle, your feet, and your toes. People forget that. And you don't see that on him. But I saw it because I was used to seeing it, you know, and, and you do that with your feet and your toes privately when you're, when you're training. You're all, you always have your feet and your toes and your ankle and 
these wild different positions when you're doing kicks and flies and things, you know. So those are always a couple of questions that nobody ever asked me. <laughs> Did they try to get, uh, I'm sure a lot of sexual questions come up. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's wonderful that you keep stuff like that to yourself. I do. I, I don't answer them. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure you hear that a lot. I'm sure you do. I don't. I don't answer them. I don't go there. Uh, it's not what he would have wanted. Um, Good girl. You know, he he was a very private man. And uh, I only talk about things that he would have thought funny or sweet or cute. And I don't talk about things that he would never have wanted to discuss. Um, that's not who he was. That's not who who and what he was about. He was his own private man in his own way. And I will take that to my grave and I will respect him in every in every way that I can uh, to uh, raise his legacy and build his legacy to what it should be and not in the way that he passed away and not in what other people choose to remember. Um, it was much, much more than that. Much more than that. Well, you're a wonderful and, person, uh, Mindy. You're a wonderful person, Mindy, and I, I got to end this here, but you're a wonderful person. I'm so glad that you did this for us. Uh, and I'm so glad that you, you take care of Elvis even still to this day. And I hope well, that I, I can I, come I, back and ask other questions at other times. I hope that'd be all right. Yes, of course. No, I, I honor him. I love him to my dying day. And then from beyond the grave but uh, if I can help in any way to raise him up that's that's what I'm doing now I didn't speak for all these years but I you know now I guess it's the time uh, somebody else put me out there and uh, I didn't put myself out there I just want to let everybody know they've asked me why mm -hmm. did I come out and I said I didn't come out somebody else put me out there and thought that I should talk and so I have and I am and I just want to make sure that it's all positive, you know, nothing negative. Good. Then this is uh, Elvis Express for Radio, and that's Mindy Miller. Take care, Mindy. For your loving way, just promise me, darling, your loving return. Pay this fire in my soul.